Hello and welcome to the spring 2022 edition of our Reimagining the Latinx Experience book talk series. My name is Rachel Moran. I'm a professor here at UC Irvine School of Law. And I wanted to, before we get started, just acknowledge a few people who make the series possible. Of course, I wanna thank our interim Dean Bryant Garth and our acting Dean Chris Whitehawk for their support of the series. I also wanted to thank Ajay Marotra and, the, and Bob Nelson at the American Bar Foundation for their ongoing support. And of course, I also wanted to alert you to the critical contributions made by our UCI Law Center's team, Aaron Hebert, Robbie Kadri, and my wonderful research assistant, Elizabeth Schatz Cordero, who is a student here at the law school and has really done a phenomenal job of helping me to put the series together. Um, you can submit your question to the chat function and Elizabeth will be monitoring the chat function and posing your questions as they come in. Now, I wanted to briefly introduce our speakers. Um, we're very fortunate to have the authors of this wonderful new book, South Central Dreams. I highly, I've read it and highly recommend it to you. Um, and the authors are Piret Pondagneo Sotelo, who is the Florence Everline Professor of Sociology at the University of Southern California. She's the author of 10 books. She's the recipient of numerous prestigious research and writing fellowships, and she's won a number of teaching and mentoring awards. She was acknowledged with a Distinguished Career Award at the American Sociological Association's International Migration Section and with the Julian Zamora Distinguished Career Award from the American Sociological Association's Latina Latino Sociology Section. Next, we have Manuel Pastor, who is Distinguished Professor of Sociology and American Studies and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California. He's also the Turpangian Chair in Civil Society and Social Change and the Director of USC's Dorrance Life Equity Research Institute. He is a prolific author and published two books, including this one just last year. Um, he has received numerous grants and is a public intellectual with widely disseminated op-eds on important topics. And for his work, he was recognized with the Champion for Equity Award from the Advancement Project, as well as Liberty Hill Foundation's Wally Marks Changemaker of the Year Award. And then we are very lucky to have with us our commentator, Aurea Montes Rodriguez, who is Executive Vice President of the Community Coalition. And she really has been dedicating her career to programs that focus on youth. And they're so important because the Latinx population is an extremely youthful one. And her work has focused on strengthening schools and families. She's worked in Los Angeles Unified School District on reforms. She also co-founded Freedom Schools um, to promote reading um, and among uh, under youth, Black and Latinx youth. And she also has worked to prevent children from entering the foster care system by strengthening families and has been part of something called the Partners for Children. South LA. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our speakers. Please remember if you have questions to put them on the chat function. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so Brian and I are gonna sort of bounce back and forth. I'm gonna start, then Brian will speak for a while, then I'll speak for a while, then Perret will deliver a stirring, inspiring, and emotional conclusion to this whole uh, event to be followed by Arias brilliant insights. So what I wanted to do was to start by talking a little bit about what motivated us to write the book in a sort of setting and a way the sort of uh, demographic uh, change baseline that uh, was uh, the context for the work that we wound up taking a look at. So there were really three motives for writing the book. Uh, like any lapsed Catholic, everything comes in a trinity. Uh, the first was listening to the news stories about South LA 
but also having deep experience actually working in South LA with groups like Community Coalition. So when you hear the news about the demographic transition of South Los Angeles from being 80% African-American in 1970 to being two thirds Latinos today, what you wind up hearing both in a lot of the academic literature and certainly in the popular press are stories around tensions and conflicts and disagreements. And it's not to say that those don't exist, but it's clear that a lot of researchers didn't go back and look at how relationships transformed over time. So there have always been Latinos in South LA, but a big transformation occurs in the 1980s. And yes, that period was marked by bumpiness in the relationships between communities. And it makes for spectacular news stories and exciting academic articles. But what does it mean to look at quotidian or daily life, the accommodations that have taken place uh, 25 years later, and the political coalitions that have formed 25 years later? So we were really interested in going beyond the news stories of the past and looking at the daily and political, daily uh, realities and political realities of the current day. The second motivation uh, is actually perhaps a bit more uh, personal. I believe Perrette also experienced this in her class, but I certainly experienced it in mine. I teach a class called Los Angeles and the American Dream. And when I first started teaching it at uh, USC, uh, I would, when I got to the section about South LA, ask, well, how many of you in this class grew up in South Los Angeles? And hands would go up. Most of those hands would be black. Then I noticed in the last couple of years I was teaching the course, I'd ask the same question and almost all of the hands that went up were brown. But what I realized was they were the same kids. They had the same sense of determination and resilience and pride of place about where they'd grown up. They were part of a community that had been cast aside and denigrated, but they were proud of where they came from and they'd acquired the skills to succeed. So understanding how place forms identity as well as race became really a central thing. And then the third big reason for doing this book is because people like Orea asked us to. That is community organizers were from Community Coalition, from CD Tech, from a number of other organizations, uh, wanted to make sure that the stories about conflict were also uh, coupled with stories around accommodation, commonality, and bridge building, which is what's going on now. But they were also very concerned that the following would happen. If you look at an area that was overwhelmingly Black in 1980 and now is overwhelmingly Latino, there is a temptation to tell a sort of Latino triumphalist story that now it's overwhelmingly Latino, now it's time for Latinos to have a voice, now it's time for Latinos to take power. But most of the Latinos who grew up in South LA don't feel that way. They, as Brett will talk about, grew up with black friends, uh, black lovers, black schoolmates, uh, black uh, relatives often. And they feel like it would be a betrayal of the history of this location to tell a triumphalist story that does not honor the historic roots and the historic importance of the black presence, that doesn't fully acknowledge that the disinvestment that impacts Latinos in South LA is because of the anti-Black racism that has driven disinvestment in those schools. And so a lot of the organizers were worried that if someone else told this story, that it would be a Latino triumphalist story. Uh, so that's the reason why we jumped in to do it. Now, it doesn't mean that there are tensions that we also cover in the book. It doesn't mean that there are also Latino triumphalist impulses on the part of some in the community that we honestly 
talk about, but it was really those three impulses. And in terms of looking at the demography, the big news headline is what I said, that it's now two thirds Latino. But it's important to realize a few things about that, that I will then hand it over to Perrette to complicate. First uh, is that it's uneven geographically. The Eastern part of South LA is now like 90, 95% Latino. The Western part of South LA, the Hyde Park, Baldwin Hills, the Crenshaw area are the places where there's still a very significant share of African-Americans. And so South LA is big. It's a, uh, you know, 26, it's a uh, 58 uh, square miles. It's a uh, 26 different uh, neighborhoods. It's uh, about 800,000 people. And you really need to break the communities up to understand their different trajectories. The second thing I would say that's important to understand about the demography is that there's a significant Central American presence. And that Central American presence occurs because part of what happened was there during the 80s and 90s when people were arriving both from Mexico and Central America and arriving in traditional entry points, those were quite crowded. And as a result, people spilled south into South Los Angeles, particularly along the Vermont corridor. And at one point, Manual Arts, uh, which is actually on Vermont, uh, had more Central American students than any high school in the United States. So big Central American presence. And then the last thing I'll say about the demography before handing things over to Perret is that it's also very undocumented and it's much more undocumented than in the rest of LA County. And I think that there's two reasons for that. One is the timing and the spillover, people from Mexico and people from Central America. But it's also that in some ways, when you talk to people about policing, that the policing in South LA is so anti-Black that lots of Latino immigrants feel like, well, this is a place we're probably not going to get looked at by the police trying to check on immigration ID because they're mostly going after Black people. Um, so it's true that they have to go after young Latinos, but the degree of anti-Blackness in policing is quite profound. I'm sure it's something that Rea can talk about, but it shows up in the data that we present. So that's the stage for thinking about the great qualitative work. And Brett, I went a few minutes over. I will go a few minutes short when I conclude. Good. Great. So I'm going to uh, address two issues. Uh, one, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we did the study. And then I want to focus on what I think are two of the big takeaways, um, particularly from um, the the primary qualitative research that we did. So I've been in sociology for a long time. Usually I work like a lone ranger. I've written books by myself, usually one research assistant. It's kind of lonesome. Uh, and for this project, we had, well, it, it felt like a cast of thousands. Really, it was about a dozen uh, research assistants and permanent staff from, uh, it's now called the Equity Research Institute. It was then uh, staff from the Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration, which Manuel founded and directed. And at that moment, I was the associate director. So we had this talented group of uh, graduate students, uh, many of whom were raised and rooted in South LA or from Huntington Park or Southgate nearby and um just an extraordinary group of individuals can't talk about all of them but one of them was um walter thompson hernandez who went on to write uh to become a, a video journalist for the new york times wrote the book compton cowboys and has, has done so much his podcast california love for example, he took many of our photos and just brought like a wonderful uh, creativity to the process. Um, Jose Miguel um, Ruiz had previously worked with me on community garden research. He helped me out in some of the work in Watts where we went to um, uh, the public parks 
and Community Gardens. He's now executive director of Cultiva LA and I'm supporting him as one of the board members. And Veronica Montes was our postdoc. Uh, she herself had been um, like a young teenage migrant um, from Mexico, went through IRCA, went through community college, got her PhD, and she was our postdoc. Today, she's a tenured professor at Bryn Mawr. So we had this incredible synergy, uh, staff from, um, from the center. Uh, and we actually, you know, I just want you to reflect for a moment. We had this big uh, conference uh, seminar table. We met regularly. We were out in the field. Well, first of all, we were planning the study. Manuel was in charge of the quantitative parts, me in charge of the qualitative, but we would be out doing interviews, coming together, reporting what we were finding. Um, does this jive with what you're seeing? What do you think it means? Um, it was a lot of um, data, a lot of management, but a lot of collective synergy that went into this book. And um, we honor the participation of our research assistants as co-authors of many of these chapters. The book is not an edited book. Uh, Manuel and I were the, the lead authors on it, but the ideas that you see in these chapters came out of these conversations around the table, shooting off emails and so on. Um, the quantitative data mostly comes from a previously collected survey uh, uh, census uh, data that Manuel and his team then used to create these incredible maps. You can see the maps in the book, um, but I'm also going to direct you to check out our website. I'm not using any slides today. I don't want to take up time, but we have a really beautiful website. It's just southcentraldreams.org. Uh, we've got a rap music video. We've got lots of photographs, more photographs than appear in the book, and they just look more beautiful on screen. Um, and with graduate student Fernando Moreno, we made um, 60 slides that I intended for use. I'm hoping that instructors would want to use this book at local community colleges, state colleges, and anybody can, can access those slides. The maps are really cool. You'll see them there. Um, in terms of putting together the qualitative portion of this study, we started, Manuel and I started talking about this in earnest in fall of 2014, and we really launched it in Jan around January 2015. And uh, part of my first task with Veronica Montes and four other, uh, three other uh, interviewers was to interview 100 Latinos in these three neighborhoods, Watts, Vermont Slauson, and um, historic Central Avenue neighborhood. And we got about half first generation uh, Latino immigrants getting the perspectives of those Central American and Mexican immigrants who had moved here from Lincoln Heights, from Pico Union, from crowded substandard apartments in South LA, who came to South LA uh, because rent was more affordable, because there was more elbow room, or because they could afford to buy their house there and they couldn't afford to buy it in East LA, priced out already in the 80s. Um, and then we interviewed the, the second generation, uh, their children, not necessarily in the same family, but uh, people who are homegrown and really home proud. Uh, second stage is we added about an, another 95 interviews. It, these were interviews that many of us conducted. These were with uh, civic leaders and community organizers. Um, and then I did a number of interviews. I had a smaller research team focused on public life in the um, the slim number of green spaces that exist in South LA. You may know Los Angeles is among the most park poor big cities in the United States, right? The way things developed here was all private little houses. And we have big parks, uh, but they're in Pacific Palisades. They're around Los Feliz. And um, so the parks 
and community gardens in South LA play an outsized role in people's lives. And, um, uh, and with my team of three, um, I focused on doing more ethnographic research for you sociology nerds, you know, this means hanging out, right? It's like the most, um, I, I want to say like the least time effective research method you could use, but one that I think really brings us closer to understanding what's going on in people's lives. Um, two big takeaways that I'm going to go over quickly. Um, and I think one is, uh, you know, falls right in line with the theme of uh, this uh, speaker series uh, that you've organized. And that is, I think we've really got, uh, uh, our book really shows um, the diversity of Latinidad and a new kind of Latinidad that has emerged in South LA. So we found really divergent experiences in our interviews with the first generation Latino immigrants uh, who came in the 80s and 90s and the second generation. As I said, the first gen came here for affordable housing. Some of them were newly arrived, others from these other neighborhoods. And for those who came in the 80s and 90s, it was not an easy reception, right? These are tough, times, this is that moment of uh, deindustrialization, divestment out of South uh, Central, out of South LA. It's a time of the crack cocaine crisis and a lot of violence, police violence, petty violence, gang violence. Um, so uh, this kind of that first generation has kind of a fearful mindset. And actually we put up a lot of uh, cages, barriers, fences, gates, really work to fortify their houses to create a sense of safety. Um, they also came in with a lot of language barriers. These are first generation Latino immigrants who are working, um, you know, multiple jobs are not able to speak English, maybe are trying to learn, but not getting very far. And many of them came uh, with some uh, anti-Black racist ideologies from El Salvador, from Mexico, which our countries are mestizo countries or complicated countries with complicated histories, but which have their own particular versions of European white supremacy that's kind of passed down through nation building and culture. So a lot of them did form relationships with their neighbors, kind of fleeting. Um, English, you know, language barriers was part of this. We did detect an interesting, kind of an unexpected finding of a black parental mentorship. So Latino immigrant parents relying on their neighbors next door, Mr. Sam, he told us, like, where are the good schools? Um, where, uh, you know, what should I, what program should I put my kids in? How can I discipline my kids in this country? Um, same, similar kind of affinity with their kids' teachers. So this kind of in new interdependencies, respect and appreciation, but still a good deal of social distance. For the second generation, it's a different story. Uh, second generation, the Latinx generation, maybe they were born in Mexico, maybe they were born in El Salvador, but they were raised in Watts. They were raised in Vermont Square neighborhoods. And so they grew up with black friends, with black schoolmates. They played on teams. They listened to the same music. They had black mentors and teachers who were important role models. Uh, in their lives. It wasn't all smooth sailing. We uh, collected a lot of uh, interviews from young people who recalled what it was like to go through these race riots in high schools where there was racial fighting um, and lockdowns, others who were bussed out. Uh, so, you know, the narrative is not just a, uh, you know, um, I don't want to say black and white, but brown and black. <laughs> but um, 
overwhelmingly our second generation feel deep affinity with African American people, friends, culture, political traditions, civil rights traditions, and most importantly, place. There is this undying love and pride of neighborhood and place. And I will say just methodologically, um, we we did a lot to, you know, uh, is, weren't random samples, but we tried not to uh, oversample. I think we did get our second gen to be slightly more educated than average because of um, who was doing our, our interviews. Um, but it was striking how many college graduates opted to come back to South LA and remain committed to this idea, to participating in community uplift, working as teachers, as therapists, as community organizers, building up um, nonprofits. Um, and uh, before I hand it over, um, oh no, I'm gonna say a little more. Uh, one thing I wanna say is um, one of our other unexpected findings was how critical the second generation was of their friends and their cousins in East LA or out in the Valley who they see as having a lot of politically incorrect anti-blackness. Um, so uh, important point for political organizing that we can go to next. A second finding, a second takeaway from our um, project more to our um, sociology nerds who study immigration uh, here. Um, I hope our, that others will be listening to the kind of alternative frameworks we're uh, positing in this book. Uh, sociology of international migration has pretty much been mired in assimilation paradigms, transnationalism, and more recently and importantly, um, looking at mechanisms of exclusion since we've been living in this deportation detention re regime for several decades now. But you know, none of those frameworks fit our findings. And you want a theoretical framework that helps you explain what you are finding. We did not find people who were aspiring uh, to assimilation to some ideal of uh, the white American mainstream or aspiring to move out to the San Gabriel Valley. We did not find a lot of transnationalism as lived experience among even our first generation, right? And we've got, you know, Manuel already said, we've got largely undocumented population and we all know we've got these big fortified borders. So the kind of transnational activity po people participated in was mostly phone calls, sending money home, you know, communicating on WhatsApp, something like that. And um, actually our deportation and detention stories, we thought we were gonna hear more of that, uh, but Manuel already explained the kind of racial dynamics that happened with policing that may explain why we didn't find that. Um, so big takeaways from our study that I'm sharing are um, a diversity of Latinidad, including a second generation that experiences, that articulates and lives close uh, affinity with African-Americans. And secondly, this paradigm that focuses on belonging, we're calling it immigrant homemaking, really looking at the way people make a place for themselves right a place that feels secure a place where you can have a sense of autonomy a place where you can make plans to launch the next generation thanks i'll stop there and pass it back great i'll try to get through this uh quickly i want to comment on the complexity of the experience that Pratt was talking about because we had one uh research assistant who actually grew up in Watts, who talked about Latina, being a small kid and being beaten up by the black kids on the way to elementary school. But then when she got sent to high school in Huntington Park, being appalled at how racist the Latinos were and fighting with them about that. And that complexity uh, 
which seems hard to hold on to, is the complexity of the actual experience. And that really does lead to what we found in the chapter on community organizing and the emergence of this strong strain of black brown organizing, which I hope that Oreo will talk a little bit more about. What I wanna do is to comment on three things that are a little bit tough for that black brown organizing. Uh, the first is the tension that Latino leaders face because they're in a mostly black determined political environment. They feel like they should be uh, uh, honoring their black elders uh, and respecting them. And yet there's a bit of impatience about when do we also lead? And that managing that tension is a real tension within the organizing community. The second thing that I think is really uh, critical to mention is that another set of the interviews was actually with about 25 black residents to ask what their sense was of this demographic change. And uh, I do wanna point out that something Perrette uh, mentioned, but I wanna be explicit about is that in general, we tried to make sure it was co-ethnics or people with a very similar experience who are interviewing other, the other people. That's why our research assistants were so heavily drawn from South LA and why it was that it was an Afro-Latino who is quite African-American in the way she presents and talks, who did the uh, interviews with black residents. And I think one key thing to understand is the sense of black loss that's going on in South LA. And that's because this was a place that was quite hard won as a base for political power, as a base for home ownership. And a lot of people, even there, we certainly interviewed black folks who felt some resentment about the Latino newcomers, but even the ones who were welcoming and understood the commonality and wanted to form coalitions also felt like, gosh, you know, our favorite skating rink is no longer. Uh, a black space is no longer just a defined black space. And organizers in South LA have to understand and respect the sense of black loss. They can't uh, gloss over it or they will not make a full connection with bringing black people into part of a coalition. <clears throat> Final thing is that just as this uh, black brown coalition building and organizing has taken full fruition. And we present several cases in the book where you could see the power of this organizing at changing uh, conditions. Just as it's taking place, the threat of gentrification is displacing both black and brown residents. And that is a really big struggle. I'm sure it's one that Oreo will talk about. Uh, but it's a really big struggle that is something that's going to be uh, important because just as there's this new sense of shared identity, place identity, coupled with race identity, it's being threatened. And then I wanna do something that I don't normally do, which is to read from uh, the book because this part's really brilliant. Uh, and it's partly about gentrification and it's partly about us because we are talking about how the future is uncertain, uh, how there's these community-based organizations that need to challenge power. And then we say, what the residents will have in their favor is something we discovered along the way in our research. Their own sense that this home one is a home worthy of defending. And then we talk about ourselves. We get it. As the reader might surmise from the discussion of rethinking theory, we as authors had academic ambitions when we took up this project, including the desire to challenge concepts of ethnic succession, develop notions of place identity and home, and explore what it means to do deeply coalitional organizing for social justice. What we did not fully anticipate when we started this journey, even though we and members of our team had worked in and around South LA for years, was that we would find ourselves 
doing just what earlier Black migrants, as well as first and second generation Latino interviewees did before us. Fall in love with the place. We love South LA. Brett, you get to clean up. Yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to make two points. One is just kind of uh, following up on this important issue of a sense of black loss uh, that Manuel mentioned, and I I just want to uh, direct you know say that at the research at, uh, community gardens in Watts and the public parks we found a lot of green spaces that are used as black spaces and others that are used as Latino spaces and primarily men spaces. I mean, there is a whole analysis of, of gender in here, too. So I think it's really important to honor and recognize the importance of having kind of a sovereign public space. And I think that's found in these spaces. And one of my other unexpected findings at uh, Martin Luther King Park in particular was uh, interviewing African American men who no longer live in that area, but come every Sunday, they might be out in the valley they're living in some other municipality but they return because it's kind of a spiritual home right there's a drum circle there's a barbecue there's something going on, and it remains uh, this cherished. Um, home, even though they're no longer living um, in the neighborhood. And finally, I'm going to return to um, the research process and say collaboration takes time, paciencia. Sometimes you do things wrong, uh, like we tried to rush the coding again for the so social research people here. We tried to rush the coding. We had a lot of great minds in the room, but you know, we kind of mucked it up and it had to be redone uh, again. And uh, fortunately, I had a whole fellowship year uh, that allowed me to sit with this material. But at the end of the day, all research is partial. It's incomplete. We tried to be as careful and as thorough and as rigorous as we could be checking back and forth. Um, but, you know, there's limitations to every project. And I would say one of our limitations is that we only interviewed folks, the, the qualitative part, we only interviewed folks who were still living or were present in South LA, like the guy who rode in from his motorcycle, the people um, who are actually living uh, there. So people who've exited may feel differently. And at the beginning of the project, our eyes were big. We thought we're going to do it all. We thought we're going to go out and we're going to interview African Americans who are now living in Santa Clarita or San Bernardino. But, you know, at the end of the day, you can't do it all. Uh, so you kind of have to be humble about it and hope that this is a foundation for the next generation of um, committed research in South LA. So. Brad, I'm glad you could it. Kendrick Lamar on the way out. Be humble. <laughs> out um, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I, it is going to be difficult to be a commentator. This is a, a tough job. I, I first want to say thank you uh, for having me as a commentator and thank you for all of the work that you've done uh, before writing this book. Uh, I remember when you both published the Raices uh, Roots report um, with your team um, at USC and um, the symposium that happened after that publication, I remember going to Manuel Pastor after, and I'll introduce myself next and talk about our work and some of the takeaways that I uh, have made note of from the book. But I remember going to Manuel and saying the way that a person, a fellow panelist talked about the transition from our former CEO to our existing CEO made it seem like there was an intentional um, change of power or succession of power because of demographic uh, shift. And it really misses 
uh, you know, the essence of who we are as a black brown organization that is really committed uh, to racial justice and race equity, right? And uh, and Manuel said, you know, uh, I hear you. I think that you spoke well about the community, uh, the, the work of, of community coalition. And uh, we are beginning the groundwork or we, we've laid the groundwork uh, to write a book on South LA that will lift up the vo voices of Latino uh, leaders and so and residents and people you know uh, from different generations and so I thank you for staying uh, focused and for um, doing a, a great job of really including the voices of uh, a significant and important uh, part of the South LA community that has historically been excluded or left out, um, especially when discussions are happening about the Latino community in the city or the county or statewide. Uh, South LA is thought of as uh, a Black community, even though the demographics, you know, over the last uh, decades uh, have shown that there has been a shift, but that the role and presence of the Black community is so critical uh, to uh, not just to LA City, but to other communities that are um, becoming more and more racially diverse. So, uh, you know, in terms of a little bit about me, uh, to start, uh, I am a first generation. Uh, immigrant. And so I was born in Mexico and my mother came here to South Central LA with my brother uh, and me after my father died. And she did that because in Mexico, she had only gotten a first one year of formal schooling um, because her hometown was a school poor. We talked about um, you know, uh, park poor neighborhoods, her, her, her uh, hometown did not have schools. Um, and she had heard that in the US, uh, children of poor parents would have more opportunities. And so I'm one of those first generation immigrants who settled in a majority whose you know, family moved into a majority black street. Um, and attended a majority black school. And that's important because I identified with so many of the stories that were documented about a teacher, a librarian, um, you know, a, a, a neighbor uh, who really created opportunities for me. And uh, honestly, uh, that put me on a college track during the height of the crack cocaine epidemic that ravaged South Los Angeles during the mid eighties. Um, and so I, I want to share that a little um, bit about me. Um, I actually started at Community Coalition in 1997 through a youth organizing internship and have been with the organization since. And that's a really long time. I now have an 18-year-old who's studying first year in college, a 16-year-old who is a, a junior in high school, and a 12 a 12 year old uh, child and my children have grown up in the context of my work uh, in South Los Angeles and at Community Coalition. And a little bit about our organization because it was featured in different parts of the book. Um, the organization Community Coalition where I work uh, was founded by now US Representative um, uh, Karen Bass, who's also running um, for mayor in LA City. Um, and she she founded the organization in 1990 to deal with the impacts of the crack cocaine epidemics. And she was really looking at all of the pieces that um, Dr. Um, Andu, uh, Andanu uh, Sotelo uh, spoke to deindustrialization, um, you know, uh, um, public disinvestment and white flight. And understanding that from the very beginning, she founded Community Coalition to be a black brown organization. And so what that means is that one of the first staff that she hired um, is a Latina who uh, built up our organizing capacity and who has actually worked with the United Farm Workers. Um, and so for 30 years, we've been committed to building uh, black and building uh, black and brown leadership 
uh, to advance uh, people power and to build uh, political power as well. And we are intergenerational in all of the work that we do. And so I, with that, I wanna transition with, you know, what I loved most about the book. So if you look at the cover, the person that's on the cover is Jeanette Martinez, who is an alumni of the youth organizing program at Community Coalition. But mo more importantly, with her mother, she co-founded an organization called Cielo, en el Cielo LA, Comunidades Indígenas en Liderazgo Los Angeles, and their organizing indigenous migrants uh, in Los Angeles and beyond uh, to really, and they have a racial justice perspective. Um, Cecilia Castellanos, who was featured um, also in the book, uh, she's an educator, went to an Ivy League school and has helped to inform the educational equity fights that we've led uh, at the LAUSD, but also increase the amount of resources for uh, a park that was really impacted by violence and homicides in South LA. Um, and Etna Chavez, who traveled to DC in a delegation of 30 students and parents to talk about um, the trauma and the reality of uh, Gu um, gun violence that impacts youth and families on a daily in communities like South LA. And I want to lift those up for two reasons. One, they are Latina women that are leading, Latina indigenous women that are leading, and that to me really speak to how South LA is going to move forward uh, in terms of being um, both multiracially um, diverse or, or multi-ethnic diverse, right? But also very clear on the strengths of the community, right? Uh, and that is the people who live here and who are really ensuring that we honor uh, both the experiences of the African-American community, because the truth is one of the pieces that I think Manuel uh, bring, uh, brought up in terms of the nuance in generations. If you grew up in South LA, you learned about the Black, um, the civil rights movement and the role of Black leaders in the civil rights movement, but also the Black power movements. And I think that it's that rich history and the understanding of our history, both the economic conditions, um, the public disinvestment in the community, that when people have to navigate those daily interactions and experiences, people are able to see um, you know, to understand the nuances because uh, we also understand the larger context that impacts the day-to-day -day interactions. And so, um, you know, the last piece around, um, you know, the, the relationships of the Latinos in South LA to the Black community or what I call being in, in, in uh, relationship and close proximity to the Black community uh, is two other academics uh, who uh, did a statewide um, study looking at longitudinal findings of youth organizing for Black and Brown youth. Um, but Dr. Veronica Terriquez and Dr. John Rogers, they're both at UCLA now. Uh, Dr. Terriquez worked closely with uh, Dr. Manuel Pastor. Um, they looked at the fact that youth who got involved in organizing uh, during their youth years were more likely to stay civically engaged in college and beyond. But for us in South LA and at Community Coalition, uh, we were really excited to find that 80% of the kids who went on to college uh, came back to South LA and saw South LA as home. And so in terms of what we do with um, you know, all of the findings in this important uh, book and, you know, um, and thinking about the fact that uh, I think the book says 90% of Lat Latinx uh, children under 18 are U.S. born, right? So we have a young uh, and emerging uh, Latino demographic that will be voting and building political power. And so for us, it's really thinking about how do we continue to do the education and the history of South LA, the, the important role that the Black community continues to play in building political power at all levels, um, not just in South LA, but in the country. Um, and how do we 
um, invest and build up our political uh, leadership pipeline in a way that continues to fight anti-Black racism, um, both in South LA and beyond. And so uh, I am aware of time. And so maybe this is a good place uh, for me to pause. Well, thank you. We've gotten so many highly complimentary comments about the talk and all of your presentations. And now we wanted to take a few questions from the audience. Elizabeth? Yes, uh, thank you so much. And if you get a chance to look at the Q&A and all the positive responses, I highly recommend that. Um, but we've also gotten some great questions. So first one, when uh, Reagan offered am amnesty to undocumented immigrants, how did it affect the Latinx community? The general question is that, or the general answer is that it led to a lot of uh, legalization and political power. The nuance in South LA is that South LA was about 20% Latino in uh, 1980. It was about, uh, it had become 45% Latino by about 1990. Virtually none of the, that jump in population was had sufficient time on the ground to be eligible for IRCA. And so you see very low rates, you see very high rates of undocumented and then very low rates of naturalization uh, within South LA. And that gets to some of the questions of political disempowerment that uh, we were referring to earlier. Maybe I'll just chime in on that and say, remind us that it was 3.1 million people who got legalized uh, through IRCA in 1986. Majority, like about 2 million were uh, Mexicans, the next biggest number, Central Americans. And we know those years, the 80s and 90s are huge years. I mean, for migration from Mexico and El Salvador. So, you know, the door closed basically um, creating you know, the 11 million undocumented people we have living without rights in our country today. So. I, I mean, our family adjusted our status um, during, with IRCA and, you know, I have seen the effects of the, um, what is it now, over 30 years um, of, of young people that have not been able to adjust their immigration status and have had to find other ways to continue to advance their education and um, and do the work that they want to do uh, in our communities. And so I think the real commitment uh, in South LA and understanding too that there are, is a significant Black immigrant population in South Los Angeles that is really engaged on uh, immigrant rights work. Um, I do see a question about, you know, the Guatemalan, um, the Guatemalan indigenous uh, community. And, you know, I, I do want to lift up the work of Comunidades Indígenas and Liderazgo um, in Los Angeles because they actually did a mapping project that shows uh, the indigenous community and the diversity, including the, the large uh, Central American indigenous community and the the mapping project is actually, it might still be up through this week at LACMA, but it's available um, online. And I do think that the push for uh, language access um, in all the systems that people have to interact with, uh, the child welfare system, LAUSD, uh, but also, um, you know, what we're finding is an increased number of children that are in detention centers that don't have proper representation uh, because they don't have, um, you know, language representation from attorneys there. I think that that issue is also getting addressed uh, by Cielo LA. Thank you. And I don't know if um, the other presenters also wanted to respond to this question about um, language barriers. Considering that Guatemala is a majorly indigenous country, there is a wide range of indigenous languages that do not get recognized by the state and multiple institutions in LA. In what ways, if at all, did Central Americans ch challenge ideas of Latinidad and who is considered to be Latino? Additionally, in terms of gentrification and displacement, what is USC's role in these processes? So I'll answer the last, I think actually Orea was addressing the first question and uh, the great work of Cielo and others. Uh, USC 
is an active force in gentrifying the neighborhood um, because its investments in and around have driven up the uh, housing values um, and rents, and I think helped to create uh, displacement. It's not the only, I, this is not to make, minimize that. So I just acknowledge that. But the other drivers are the rail investment through the neighborhood, which has led to developments along the rail lines. It's also the fact that the economic engines in Los Angeles have moved to the west side. And so there's a lot of people, I mean, I blame a lot of this on ways. People getting off the freeway, driving through South LA and realizing something, which is that the boulevards are tattered because there's a lack of public and commercial investment. But when you get into the neighborhoods, you see the pride of place of people maintaining their homes. And that's led to a lot of, along with housing prices, a lot of interest in buying homes in South LA. So there's multiple pressures. USC is one. If I could add one thing that didn't get asked is I think it's important to realize that the demographic shift in South LA was a combination of black flight and Latino in migration. So it's also the case that the deindustrialization, which led to a lot of job loss, and then to a lot of led to the company by the crack cocaine epidemic and over policing, led a lot of working class and middle class black families to exit. And Latinos were spilling in at the same time. So it's, it, you know, these two things uh, were both going on when you think about the demographic change. I will just add in 30 seconds, an invitation to um, um, graduate students, other social researchers out there. This is a big question. I mean, this is again, one of the instances where I think where we provide a foundation, wish we could have done it all, wish we could have done a more intensive uh, investigation into real estate transactions in South LA. Uh, USC is absolutely an imperial force, uh, especially at the Northern end. But as Manuel said, it's not the only one. And uh, Latino home ownership is also part of the story today. So I was, as I was doing my interviewing, I was surprised to hear uh, some of the first generation folks I was interviewing saying that actually they welcomed some of these changes because they knew the house that they bought, uh, you know, 20 years ago is now worth five times what they and and there's displacement and gentrification, and we've seen an increase of how of um, families, uh, women with children that are experiencing houselessness. And so, uh, for us, uh, not having the adequate housing for entire family units, uh, even within our membership, who cannot find housing and do not know where to go, uh, where they are uh, not going to experience. Um, you know, challenges and harassment by police or lack of understanding from other communities. Well, I wanted to thank all of the panelists today for an absolutely wonderful discussion. We've gotten lots of positive comments. We're sorry we couldn't get to all of your valuable questions, but I want to not only thank the panelists, but the audience, and we hope to see you at our next talk in the series featuring uh, Diego Vigil with James Diego Vigil with commentary by Gilberto Conchas, uh, Conchas, and that's going to be on Chicano high schoolers and a change in Los Angeles. Another, it's a longitudinal study of the changing identities of students in the schools. And so it's very interesting because it also delves into these questions of the complexity of Latinidad. So thank you again. We appreciate your being here today. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.